Thank you very much, Zuri. For those of you that got herded back here because you thought Jonathan Thompson was talking about future scenarios, um, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> and and we, we rearranged the order a little bit, and so we're starting with sort of a fundamental building block of the landscape. Um, you've heard about the importance of some change agents that are insects this morning, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, about change agents um, that have two legs. Um, this work is informed by, by the, the work we do down at UMass in our Family Forest Research Center, as well as the work we do here every summer with Harvard Forest RU students. And it's an important, um, I think, social science component of the Harvard Forest LCER. So um, traditionally, foresters are, are trying to promote the use of management plans uh, to help landowners be good stewards of their forest. Uh, nationally, fewer than 5% of American landowners have these. Uh, roughly 15% of eligible Massachusetts landowners are, are interested in this, this approach. Um, we spend millions and many hundreds of thousands of dollars on this approach, but in many cases it's, it's sort of this conventional conservation outreach approach, but it doesn't seem to resonate with most landowners. Um, most of the landowners we know have have different interests and objectives. You know, they're interested in nature, like the, the salamander in that woman's hand. You know, they, they have different needs for information than most professionals would like them to have. So what we want to do is, from an extension and outreach standpoint, as well as from a, a future scenarios landscape change standpoint, understand better who these people are, how they make the decisions that they do, that in turn influence the nature of and the future of the landscape that's out there. Since we know most of them aren't doing this, we need to find out more about that, basically. How they make decisions, how that manifests itself. That led us to some pilot work in 2008 and a follow-up study in, in 2010 <coughs> looking at social networks. If landowners aren't getting that much information from professionals with licenses and degrees, who do they talk to about their land and how are they making decisions? This pilot work was done with um, uh, structured interviews, 47 structured interviews, talking to people about who do you talk to about your land? What are your informal social network sources of information, especially if you're poised to make a decision either to sell your land, develop your land, harvest your forest, or whatever. Who do you talk to anyway about this? Very sort of open-ended structure. Last summer, again, with two great RU students here, um, because our sample size when you do structured interviews is limited, we wanted to see if we could replicate that and estimate social networks around private woodland owners using a more structured mail survey format. And um, we were pleased that we got a number of people that responded. In general, we estimate that people are talking to roughly eight people in their social networks in most cases. Although importantly, and this isn't to scale here, um, but when we did the structured interview, we talked to one woman who has what she referred to as 63 people in, the, in her social network. So we, we had to take the blank yellow cat away from her. She'd still be writing down names of all her friends and, and neighbors and what have you. Um, interestingly, you know, from a psychological standpoint, we gave people in the mail survey um, a table and they could fill out who they talked to and what kind of people they are, how much they trust them and things. Um, and there's this one kind of archetype of person. You know, we gave them 18 lines in the table and they filled them. <laughs> and in fact, there were a couple people that wrote down in the margin, you know. Um, so, so the indirect information is there are social networks out there. People are utilizing them. They're talking to one another about their land and their decisions. And there are some people that are pretty plugged in when it comes to their land. So from an outreach extension standpoint, our goal is to find those people and empower them with good information because we know they're providers thereof. In terms of the composition of the average, if there is such a thing, social network, we find uh, most social networks around landowners involve family members, neighbors, you know, informal friends, other peer with landowners, um, the, the vernacular New England concept of a local, um, who isn't necessarily a family member, neighbor, friend, or, or fellow woodland owner, but we all know who those locals are, right? <laughs> you live in a New England town, you know who the local is and who I'm going to talk to if I'm going to make a decision about my land. Um, some social networks included loggers, private foresters, public foresters, and land trusts. I was pleased to hear about that referred to, to the role of land trusts um, this morning. I've got a little more information on that. 
Interestingly, this past summer, we, we wanted to know not only where do you get information in terms of your social network, but how often are you asked for information? Are you seen in your community as a, a source of information? And, you know, 60% you know, said, you know, I'm not a source. I ask around, but, but no one asks me. But, you know, there's a, a non-trivial segment of the population we sample that represents some form of a source of information that's informal, non-professional, if you will, and is helping people make decisions. We used an open-ended question and said, well, if you provide information, what kind of information do you provide? And this is a wordle, and the size of the words is a function of how often they appeared in the open-ended response. And you can see they talk about things like wildlife and trees, land, trees again, current use, experience. You can look closely, there's forester down there. <laughs> there's, there's harvesting and, and logging and things. But, um, oh, there's plan right there. <laughs> you can look closely, but, but this is helpful. This is illuminating because it tells us how these people think and what kind of information they're exchanging. So we wanted to find out more, since we know most landowners don't avail themselves of professional information, we wanted to basically develop a, a tool to assess how aware people are of their conservation alternatives, so that when they come to that decision point in time, to make a decision that's going to influence the future of their property and the cumulative effect of which is going to influence the, the fate of the landscape, when they come to that time, they, we want to be able to measure how aware they were of their alternatives and their information. So it was based on, on this notion of a consumer confidence index. And you might have heard about that on NPR or somewhere, where you know, there are eight or ten questions that the confer conference board asked people. How confident are you you'll have a job in the next six months? How likely are you that you'll buy you know, a major appliance in the next six months? And there are eight or ten questions that give you a relative idea of how confident someone is in, in the economy. So, so building on that, we developed what we call our Conservation Awareness Index. It's two legal size pages um, based on four subject categories, things that landowners would be logically making a decision about, current use property programs, property tax programs, conservation easements, harvesting or estate planning. And we wanted to gauge their relative familiarity, their knowledge, to determine whether or not they had first or second hand experience with those things, and then where they might go, where they might go <laughs> when the PowerPoint slide goes out. <laughs> so actually, I can keep talking because I can see mine here. <laughs> Did I step somewhere I wasn't supposed to? Okay. Well, I'll just keep going because I'm on a short leash. Um, <laughs> So we did two things. We have a, a cohort of people we've been working with for about 20 years. Um, they're an informal network of community opinion leaders. Annually, we bring 25 people here to the Harvard Forest. We train them for three or four days. We empower them with conservation information and send them back to their respective communities. And on that basis, they serve as advocates or spokespersons for good decision making at the local level. Since there's kind of one and a half extension forests statewide and over 40,000 private woodland owners, this is an effective way to reach that audience. So we applied our Conservation Awareness Index to a bunch of people who are our alumni. And we also sent it to 500 randomly selected woodland owners with greater than 10 acres. And you know, this was a pilot test. We developed the instrument. We wanted to see you know, what the results looked like. How much variation is there in conservation awareness? Does everyone just answer the same way? Did they hit the ball out of the park? And did we develop a silly instrument? Or did we get some breadth in terms of response? Fortunately, we saw in our so-called benchmark response that conservation <coughs> awareness is relatively high compared to random respondents. In terms of familiarity with our four subject areas, you know, it was relatively low. People said they, you know, some of the time they had some kind of familiarity, but, you know, never heard of or knew nothing about was a relatively frequent response. We tried to gauge their knowledge on those four subject areas, and, you know, I don't know, was the most common response, you know, when it came to asking them specifically about property tax information, conservation easements, and things. 
We tried to gauge how much first and second hand experience they had with these things, because logically, people with that kind of experience would have relatively high awareness. But again, you know, not a lot of first hand and, and you know, some perhaps second hand experience implying that they have social networks and they're talking to one another. And you know, this was interesting, a relatively low acquaintance with information resources. So if you don't have experience, you don't know what to do, you've never heard of the program, where would you go for information? And in terms of being able to name people, um, you know, most people didn't score very well. More than half didn't provide a name or a lead or, or an idea of where they might go when they're at a point in time to make a decision. So relatively low um, conservation awareness out there. The good news is that mostly people were just confused. There's sort of a big fog when it comes to making a decision. And we didn't detect that much misinformation out there among the population. This is one of the things that's going to then dovetail nicely, hopefully, into Jonathan's discussion of um, future scenarios, because this was our, our little sample population where we tested the Con Conservation Awareness Index out here in Western Mass. Um, and we wanted to find out, you know, is there some kind of spatial relationship? You know, do, do, is there a random occurrence of, of conservation awareness across the landscape? Or, or do neighbors, do people talk to one another? Can we actually see spatially and map? you know, the, the, the connections between people, and is there any kind of relationship with what's going on in terms of conservation on the land? Conservation restrictions, ag preservation restrictions, you know, protected, you know, public sector open space and things. And so we mapped, you know, the, the CHI scores in these towns, and, you know, we'll be analyzing to look for a relationship of, you know, physical proximity to one another, physical proximity to protected areas, is there a relatively higher chi-score in a town with an active land trust, or a relatively higher chi-score in a town with lots of protected open space, or as Robert was talking about, in a community with a, a current um, open space plan? You know, how does the chi, how does conservation awareness rank? In terms of future directions, um, things that, that we believe represent great major questions, and again, I think they dovetail nicely both with public policy kinds of things as well as future scenarios. Um, how does information flow between landowners, and importantly, through landscapes? How does it move, transmit? Does it have a half-life so that if we teach somebody here something in 2011, does it dissipate and go away by 2013 because they forget or they don't use it? You know, so how, how active does information flow? Um, Again, as I mentioned before, is it spatially random or is it related to some kind of conservation circumstance on the landscape? What facilitates information flow? Is it a lot of bake sales by the local land trust? Is it a paid staff person in that town? Is it a state agency with the, with the state agency truck that drives around and, and organizes things? And, and importantly, in terms of landscape change, how often do landowners face a decision anyway? How likely? Are we going to be seeing these kinds of individually, independently implemented landowner decisions across landscapes, especially across those transects we heard about this morning? Uh, synergies with other projects, you know, as I've mentioned, this is an obvious one to me. The more we know about conservation awareness, informed decision making at the heart of these individual change agents, uh, the better we likely we are to be able to estimate future scenarios. And I think, though I haven't seen the slides, that Jonathan's going to talk a little bit about that. Um, in a minute or two. I have to point out that I've been doing this work with, you know, great RU students here in the summer, um, Paul Cadzero and Tyler Van Fleet down at UMass. Brett Butler works the Forest Service across the hall from me at UMass. Eli Sagor is a counterpart of mine, the Extension Forester at the University of Minnesota. And Mark Rickenbach is a former Bullard Fellow here and does Extension Forestry work out in Wisconsin. <coughs> Uh, 
would you dare speculate mm -hmm. on, on how they might fit into that graphic? You know, that's the big, that's the big question. Uh, we need to, you know, we, we developed a tool, it took us a couple of years. Um, we pilot tested it last year. We're sending out another much bigger round in a month or so. But what we really need to do is link awareness to, to actual behaviors. Mm -hmm. Because there's certainly going to be a circumstance where you might have, you might hit the Kai ball out of the park, if you mm -hmm. pardon the sports analogy. But depending on your fiscal exigency or whatever, you might need to make a decision that runs counter to your conservation awareness. So we, we need to definitely follow up on, on that interesting relationship and find out under, under what circumstances does it break down, how often does it break down, and how many times does it hang together. So short answer, not yet, but, but you're exactly right. Okay, one more question, and then we can ask questions. You know, we tested for that. We, we didn't load onto our instrument. You know, it was one simple piece of legal-sized paper front and back, and we scrunched our 16 Kai questions in there. But we did put in a few things about age of the person, uh, whether they're resident or absentee landowners, and the size of their ownership. And um, there is not a relationship between Kai and ownership size. So you can be a big landowner and be just as confused during the fog <laughs> as, um, as a little landowner, at least in the Yeah, great question.